My task is to summarize this book, Emmanuel in Our Place by Tramper Longman. The subtitle is Seeing Christ in Israel's Worship. While there are times the, the temple rituals of the Old Testament can seem so violent and exclusive and even remote from what Jesus accomplished in the New Testament. And so Longman's goal is to provide a very Christ-centered lens with which to read the Old Testament and to dwell on the different aspects of priestly theology in the Old Testament to convey that each moment, each sign, each person were intentionally prescribed by God to foreshadow Christ's ultimate fulfillment of all these priestly functions. And most particularly how Christ as Emmanuel came to be the one who acts as the propitiation and substitute for our sins. The book's divided into four sections, sacred space, sacred acts, sacred people and sacred time. And within each of these areas, Longman describes how Christ comes to fulfill space, acts, people and time. So with regard to space, Longman starts with Utopia itself, the Garden of Eden, the place where God's presence was known and felt. And yet after the fall, we needed another way to draw near to God and God directed his people to erect altars in different places where they could offer sacrifices. The altar was then followed by the tabernacle during the wilderness and God provided very detailed instructions on the construction of this place. The materials moved from less precious to more precious as you entered the Holy of Holies. Perhaps what Longman points out in all these uh, places, though, is that in both altar and tabernacle, there are whispers of former creation. Altars were erected beside trees, and he suggests that's maybe reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. And then with tabernacle, just as the spirit first hovered over creation for the first time, the tabernacle also had the spirit hovering there. He goes as far as to suggest that the instructions of the tabernacle in Exodus 27 can be divided into seven neat parts, mirroring the seven days of creation. And the tabernacle was dedicated on New Year's Day, symbolizing recreation. Also, when we get from tabernacle to temple and Solomon's temple, there are similar creational motifs and impulses there from the construction of it, which is a cube echoing cosmos and design. The basin of water is called the sea and it's uh, demonstrating God's power to put in order even the watery chaos. The menorah um, is also tree-like reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. And so when Jesus came in John 1 saying that he tabernacled with us and immediately the connection here is established that Christ is taking all these ideas into himself and renewing them. Uh, when he dies the, the curtain of the temple is torn in two and the possibility of everlasting communion and presence with God akin to the Garden of Eden is re-established. So Christ's efficacy is probably demonstrated most powerfully in Revelation where John notices that in this holy city there's no longer a temple, it's no longer needed because Christ is the temple. Moving on to sacred acts, Longman breaks down every type of sacrifice, he neatly categorises them according to their purpose. There's a cluster of uh, sacrifices to do with atonement, that's the atonement gift or grain offering and then the fellowship sacrifice. The atonement ola sacrifice is the most important. The grain offering is encouraged as a sign of the covenant and the shelamine is to promote fellowship. And interestingly, that fellowship offering, the fat is taken off the animal, that's the most important part of it, and it's put on top of the Ola atonement animal. And that's significant because it signifies that atonement is that foundation, the prerequisite to fellowship. There are other sacrifices, Longman names like Hatat and the Ashim, um, but they're to do with expiation if um, people have sinned involuntarily and these are more to do with purification than that deeper level of atonement and when we get to the new testament we're not told which of these specific sacrifices jesus comes to fulfill but all the motifs are the same 
The idea of the shedding of blood from a spotless being that's necessary for full atonement. And also things like references to Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Hilasmos sacrifice, the one who came to placate God's wrath, as it says in Romans 3, 25. And all these things suggest that Jesus is that perfect sacrifice, as it says in Hebrews, the one who covers all the sins of the world. Part three then looks at sacred people, the story of how the, the Levites came to be the sacred people of priests. Longman here, interestingly, does not shy away from the traumatic violence that foregrounds um, how Levites get on the scene. Simeon and Levi slaughtered um, to avenge their sister Dinah, and this sets up the realisation that neither of them are going to inherit the promised land. But what marks the Levites out as distinct is that moment after the golden calf incident when they're prepared to kill their own lifeblood in order to appease the holy wrath of God. Uh, and whilst for many of us it's hard to progress from violence and more violence, Longman points out the key point here is prioritising God's holiness over family ties and anything else. And that's why he calls these priests God's bodyguards for this reason. The function of the priests was uh, to enable their people to be brought into the presence of God through their mediatorial role. And it's interesting, even in their dress code, this whispers um, how they emulate being like a mini tabernacle. <coughs> the innermost curtain of the tabernacle had colours of blue, purple and scarlet that's mirrored on the priests' clothes. The hem of their garment had bells and pomegranates harking back to Eden. And in many ways, the ordination of the priest seen in the four movements of washing of water, putting on new clothes, anointing with oil, performing certain sacrifices. This mirrors the journey of what Christ does in and through us. When we become new believers, we're baptized, we're clothed with Christ, we're anointed by the Holy Spirit to be a living sacrifice. And perhaps that's why Longman goes into such detail concerning the priestly function, because in all these minuscule details, there's intention and purpose towards kingdom fulfillment, <coughs> where Jesus as the high priest enables all his people to fulfill this priestly role. The final part of the journey is sacred time and Longman looks at the Sabbath as well as other festivals to ascertain moments that foreshadow Christ's coming. He draws out the two purposes of Sabbath. One is rest from work to commune with God and be dependent on God. Then there's the Deuteronomical and Levitical idea of Sabbath intended as a reminder that God wanted to set his people free from slavery in Egypt. And it's so easy, isn't it, to see how both these attributes find fulfillment in Christ, that we're drawn nearer to God uh, and to find shalom rest, but also to be set free. The final festivals of Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Purim, in lesser ways they all present potential places for Christ's work to renew them. But it's the Sabbath really that gets the most mentioned because it's in the commandments, it's a covenantal sign and it's that priority place where Christ invites us to that deep rest with him. So in all these ways, Christ comes to renew, to redeem, to fulfill, to stand in our place. So what are the important touchstone points for ethnodoxologists? I'm going to suggest two. First of all, Longman notes that many rituals that God's people took up were not unique to Christianity, but were seen in all the prevalent other cultures. Um, God's people built altars, but so did many other cultures. Many other people centred their lives around their deities. But what is significant is how Longman says Christ came to make these rituals distinctive, freeing, inclusive by the time they reached the New Testament. So uh, culture is redeemed. Uh, the second important insight is Longman's consistent welding of Eden imagery to ritualistic worship. Uh, and that's a blending of the sacred and the secular and gives potential for ethnodoxologists to commit deeply to reclaiming all parts of culture for the kingdom after the same manner uh, as shaman and for the life of the world and also Kuiper who proclaimed there's not one square inch of creation that can't declare 
Jesus is Lord. So Longman's work is detailed, but he consistently follows through all these motifs and reclaims some dominant themes of this wide horizon of worship that all neatly turns on the work of Jesus Christ. <laughs>